and welcome again to another Nightline. To say we are honored, to say that we are privileged tonight to be able to do what we're doing for the glory of God and the upbuilding of the kingdom of God here on this earth through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ would be an understatement. There is no way in this world that I can tell you. I'll just simply try by saying thank you for tuning in this evening. We have a really good program, I believe, that has been planned for us, and we're going to dive right in here in just a moment and uh, just begin to experience what I think is going to be a very uh, applicable, very relevant, and extremely encouraging music and also some testimony. We have as our musical guest on the program this evening, John Baker and the Melody Airs. Many of you have had the opportunity to be in worship services, singings, concerts, uh, probably for over 50 years if you've been around that long with the Melody Airs. We look forward to not only hearing them sing but also talking with them in just a little while. And then we have on the program tonight a gentleman that uh, I've enjoyed thoroughly getting to know prior to coming on the air. Just a real, real good spirit and uh, just a real good connection. And I attribute that to the Lord Jesus Christ, Dr. James Dunn from Spartanburg, South Carolina, from the James Dunn Surgical Clinic. Uh, he's not going to operate on anybody tonight. We're not going to have surgery. This is not... Uh, this is not a reality show, but we are going to share with you the reality of what can happen in a person's heart when Jesus Christ changes their lives forever. That's happened with Dr. James Dunn, and we're going to find out how uh, he is fulfilling God's purpose for his life in the practice of medicine. Just going to be a really, really good program tonight. Our scripture for the evening is Romans 1:16, one of my favorite passages of scripture where the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, of the good news about Jesus Christ, because it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. Listen to this. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is divine dynamite. And we're praying that if you've never been saved, there will be a spiritual explosion of God's amazing grace in your heart tonight. We're going to go ahead and go to the Melody Airs as they sing for another day. I think 
thank you for waking my body up. I thank you for filling my empty cup. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for another day. And it is so good to be able to live another day and just to know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what a blessing it is to be on the air with the Melody Heirs and what a ministry that they have right here tonight through the ministry of Christian music. I want to encourage you, if you have a praise report or a prayer request, any way that we can help you tonight in a spiritual sense, please call that number on the bottom of the screen. There's somebody who is ready, willing, and able to pray with you tonight. We're very grateful and very honored to have on the program with us tonight from Spartanburg, South Carolina, Dr. James Dunn. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. Thank you. It is so good to see you. Even, even though... You have those LSU connections. We were talking a little bit before the program, LSU and Clemson. Uh, go Tigers, right? Go Tigers. Go right. Tigers. Right. Go Tigers. But uh, above and beyond that, uh, we have uh, a connection, not so much with the Tigers, but with the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and his name is Jesus Christ. I just love to ask you, before we talk about medicine, before we talk about ministry, missions, or anything else, tell me, and I'd just love to ask you this, who is Jesus Christ to you? Well, Keith, there's lots of, of, uh, of ways that people think about Jesus, but to me... Um, he is my resurrected Savior. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a, a home of uh, in Kansas City, Kansas. My mom and dad were uh, very strong Christians. So I learned about Christ from an early age, and I was cradle rolled. And uh, and but when I was a, a seventh or seven or eight year old boy, um, the Lord spoke to my heart, that told me I was a sinner, mm -hmm. and that uh, of course. Being a Baptist, we, there's, we've got a lot of catchwords as Baptists that we use, you know. So, but so, so yeah. if anyone's listening who is not uh, familiar with those catchwords, you know, you know, I knew that I had done some wrong things in my lifetime, yeah. and that, uh, that uh, my parents had taught me that when you do wrong things, there's a penalty to be paid, right? Like whether it's putting your hand in the cookie jar, or whether it's taking pulling your sister's hair, or whatever, there's penalties to be paid. And so, I learned early on that there's penalties to be paid for wrong actions, and so. I learned through my Sunday school teacher and so forth that I could see, have forgiveness for that through Jesus Christ as my Savior. So I uh, grew up in the Baptist faith. And so sure. in, our, in our faith, uh, if you accept Jesus as your Savior, then you have a baptism. And of course, the, the baptism makes you wet. It doesn't make you, you know, saved. Right. Making the decision makes you saved. But, right. but that's, the, that's the symbol for, in, our, in the church that I grew up in. Sure. And so... Uh, I accepted uh, baptism at that time. I was probably about fourth or fifth grade because I know that happened in Kansas City. And then I moved to Nashville in uh, Tennessee in the sixth grade. So I know it was before I got to Nashville. So mm -hmm. I say fourth or fifth grade. And so as I grew up in Nashville, um, I kind of kept living with the same faith I had back in Kansas City as a, as a fourth grader or fifth grader. And uh, as I grew older and w went off to to high school and then went to college. I had a great experience at, at LSU with my Baptist Student Union. We called it Baptist Student Union back in those days. Now right. we call it Baptist Campus Ministry. Uh, Frank Horton was a, a great man that encouraged me. Uh, I grew more, grew more at my church there and went back to medical school in t Tennessee and continued to grow. And with knowledge-wise, I grew a lot and learned a lot of things knowledge-wise, but my spiritual life didn't grow too much. Right. You know? And uh, I did my residency, and we'll talk more about that later on, but uh, 
I, I came to uh, Spartanburg in about 1993, and that's right when the Promise Keepers movement was starting. Oh, yeah. And uh, our church uh, in Spartanburg got real involved in Promise Keepers. And we took a trip up to Indianapolis. And in Indianapolis, I was sitting next to my friend uh, Bruce Cash. And Bruce Cash has passed away now, but he was a great friend of mine. We, we, he taught me how to drive the church bus and so forth. But I was sitting next to Bruce, and I said, Bruce, I said, you know, I just feel like here I am, I guess by that time I must have been about 33 mm -hmm. by that time. I said, I feel like I'm still living on the same old faith that I had back as a fourth or fifth grader. Right. I said, but I know a whole lot more about willful sinning now than I did back, you know, just pulling my sister's hair or, you know, doing things that fourth or fifth graders do. That, you know, there's sin, sin involved there. Sure. Things. But sure. by the time I was 33, I knew a lot more about willful sinning. And so I, I said, I just feel like that I'd like to ask the, I'm just not sure that I've done enough. You know, or that the Lord has covered my sin. He said, well, James, he says, we're right here at Promise Keepers. If you feel like you want to just recommit your, the Lord as your profession of faith, then right. why don't you go down there to the front? I'll go, I'll go down with you. I, I, I can't remember now with what I went down myself, but anyway, I did that. And I said, well, I just want to tell my folks around me on this trip, this bus, this bus load of men, that Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. I want to involve him in all my decisions every day. And Amen. so... I try to live that way, but of course, I am fleshly. I'm sure. human, so, so he is, he is the person that I'm supposed to. I try to bounce everything off of you know, my my savior, my my confidant, my partner. He's your Lord. He's my Lord. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. When when you had that experience at Promise Keepers, did uh, did you get on the bus and t and tell everybody? What had happened to well, you? Well, of course, like? most of the people that were that we were we kind of sat in a group there. Yeah. So most of them saw me go down. But yeah. yes. Uh, uh, we had a time of testimony on the way back and so forth. We, um, so, yeah, I, I talked to him about that. And then when I got back to Spartanburg, we had, um, let's see if I can remember what his name was. Um, it will come to me before we finish talking today. He was there uh, doing a, a revival. And um, his name was on the tip of my tongue. Dr. Wilton had invited him there. But it, at any rate, um, I just felt like I wanted to make it, make it public to my church. Was it Junior church. Hill? That's exactly what it was. Yes, it was. It was Junior Hill. And Junior Hill was there, and I went down to the front. I said, Dr. Wilton, I said, I really feel like I made a genuine decision when I was in the fourth or fifth grade. But I'm a whole lot better now at willful sinning than I'm in my early 30s. And if the Lord can say something, I can say, I'm not doing it, Lord. I, I, could, I could just say no. And, so, and I said, I have wanted to recommit myself to the Lord and so I asked him if, he'd, if he would rebaptize me as an adult. Yeah. And I said, he said, well, he didn't say it in front of the whole church at that time, but he, he said, you know, you don't have to do this. He says, you, you, you don't need to do this for your salvation. I said, I know. I said, but it, it, is, it is a humbling thing for me to, to be baptized as an adult in front of my children, my church. So I can, be, I can, be, I, I can show the humility of saying, Lord is number one, I'm second. There you and, go. And so, so he baptized me and as a matter of fact my middle daughter was baptized the same day she had made her profession of faith so he baptized us together that what day. a blessing yeah. what a blessing tell me about how faith has affected your family well Keith to, to tell you the truth I'm gonna have to say that my wife gets most of the credit for that um, I do work a lot um, but my wife has just been instrumental in taking the kids to Awana Right. Trying to get them to memorize the scripture passages. Um, my wife did Bible study, did BSF for Bible study fellowship for years. And so uh, back in those days in Spartanburg, uh, the, the mothers would take the, ch the young preschool children, I, I believe it was either on Tuesday or Thursday morning, and so she would go to BSF and the kids would get taught at BSF. And so, so I give her the credit for most of the, of the hands-on. But in terms of us getting to church every week and uh, back in those days, going to Wednesday night services when the when the get, girls were small, I've got right. three daughters. Right. Um, and then my my parents are strong, strong Christians. As I mentioned in the house that I grew up in. So as grandparents, they've been wonderful. They've been on more than a hundred short term mission trips. My parents have, and so they've taken us. We've gone with them to Brazil and so forth. So they've seen my parents in action. Oh yeah. And uh, have gone to my mother has a little device. It's kind of like a little telescope that you can look through. She's not an eye doctor. She's not an optometrist, but she's got this little device and, and they can look through it and they can 
move these little wheels and it tells her what kind of glasses that they people need. And so they'll collect glasses from the Lions Club and yeah. you know, wash them in the dishwasher and get them all clean. And then she'll get them all sized up to what strength they are. And they'll, she'll have them all lined up in boxes. And so my daughters have gone with them before. And when someone gets the, uh, the little readings off the little, little scope, then they'll take them over to my daughter and then and they'll look to see what's the closest fit they can have. So they've seen missions in first hand. So that's been wonderful. And they're all three active in their churches right now, and I'm really blessed by that. And they'll they'll be able to have the not just the, the ministry as a memory, but they'll be able to have the ministry of a memory. Yes. With their grandparents yes. on on the mission field. What yeah. a blessing! What a blessing that is. When uh, I was looking over my information before I came in and saw that I was going to be sitting down and talking with a doctor tonight, my mind immediately went to Luke, Dr. Luke. How do you think it was for him in the earthly ministry of Christ as a physician who was a, who was a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and then also a companion of Paul? You know, can you imagine what it must have been like for Luke to have been working there around Galilee and yeah. Judea and so forth before Christ came along, before right. Jesus came along, okay? Trying whatever, rem whatever remedies they had, whether it was this poultice or cutting this abscess open. I mean, the stuff that he had, seeing someone who had a withered hand or who was blind, and they'd come, they'd come to Luke, and Luke would go, you've been blind from birth? You know, what could, yeah. what could, could he do? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, then to have the Lord come into ministry and then to have the Lord come up and, put some spittle on some mud and put it in the man's eyes and so forth. And the guy says, ah, oh, I see things kind of hazy. You know, they look like kind of like trees waving around. And, he's, and Jesus rubs his hands, his eyes again. And he goes, oh, I see everything clearly. I mean, Luke must have just been dumbfounded. He's just like, you know, what in the world? I, he, he was in the real medical school then, you know, to see, to see Jesus. And, and then when Jesus gave them the power to go out, you know, two by two and to, and to heal and so forth. Yeah. I mean, Luke must have just been just, just, it must have been unbelievable to him to see what could really be done with Jesus' power compared to what he had learned from his earthly teachers that, that he would probably apprentice with. To, to, to be a physician following the great physician yeah. there. I want to ask you this question. Of course, I know the answer to this question before I even ask you. I, I know where you stand, and I appreciate the fact that um, you're not just a, a Christian in name and in lip service, but you're a part of a local body of believers there at First Baptist Church in Spartanburg. And uh, I know Dr. Wilton, and I know he believes and preaches and teaches the Bible. But for the sake of somebody who's just changing channels tonight, and they're listening to this doctor who's professed Christ, and uh, let's just say that they're kind of out there on the fringe, and they're kind of skeptical, and please don't change the channel right yet because this is for you. They're, they're wondering if they could talk to you in person, they would ask you, how compatible really is science and faith? What, what would you, because you've been there and done that, you've, you've studied that, you had to study that to become a doctor. Yeah. And since they can't ask you that, because they're not here, I want to ask them that for you. There are some things that we just don't know the answers to, okay? Yeah. But there are so many things that are so miraculous. Like, like when, when I see how the body works, how yeah. the body heals, so yeah. forth, I think this is an amazing creator. You know, in, in Psalm it says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Right. You know, there are so many things that Luke didn't know 2,000 years ago yeah. that we know now about medicine. There's so many things that we're going to learn as we go forward. It is amazing to me how the Lord put things together. For instance, this, this afternoon or this, this morning, uh, one, of my, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Reinhardt and I, did an operation on someone who needed to have part of their intestine taken out. And so we did the operation together. He's a good friend of mine. We cut a portion out and then sewed it back together. And we used stitches to sew the thing back together. And in God's miraculous... I mean, this, just, just, this just, just didn't happen by yeah. chance. Yeah. That, those three layers of intestine are going to heal back together and that gentleman is going to be restored to being able to eat the food that he likes to eat and do the things he likes to do because of the marvelous creation that, that the Lord has made our bodies. I mean, it, it, is, it is just remarkable. I, one of my hobbies 
keep is uh, I keep bees, and anyone who has kept bees, that that is such an orderly society. It is there's no way that by chance, by evolution, by just by by a few paramecia getting together and so forth, that, yeah. that, that, the, that the colony of a beehive, it's just a miracle how orderly it is. My wife and I, we can look out our back window and see our beehives in the backyard. It is just, it reaffirms my, my, my faith in God and his, and his orderly world every time I look at the bees out there. And it's, a, it's a God thing. It's a God thing, yeah. It's a God yeah. thing. Yeah. I want you to hang around with me for a little bit longer. Would Absolutely. you do that? Absolutely, sure. It is yes, so sir. good to have you. Thank you. It sincerely is. We're going to go back to the Melody Airs right now as they are singing in the midnight hour. What's that sound down in Jericho? Singing, singing in the midnight hour. Marching and waiting for the trumpet to blow. Singing, singing in the midnight hour. God's cheerful march seven times around. The walls of the city came tumbling down. They were led by a heavenly power. Singing in the midnight hour. What's that sound coming out of the jail? Singing, singing in the midnight hour. Preachers with no one to go their bail. Singing, singing in the midnight hour. They prayed till the Lord started shaking the ground. They never even knew when the walls came down. Surrounded by a heavenly power. Singing in the midnight hour. Well, God's people know that deliverance comes when the troubles and trials are finally done. The world keeps raining on the flood and the fire. What's that sound ringing out of the sky? Singing, singing in the midnight hour. Saints of God are getting ready to fly. Singing, singing in the midnight hour. There in the dawn of resurrection day, where the blast of the trumpet will be called away, raptured out by heavenly power. Singing in the midnight hour. Well, God's people knows that the deliverance comes when the troubles and trials are finally done. The world keeps bringing on the flood and the fire, but we're still singing in the midnight hour. Singing, 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 singing in the Thank you, Melody Airs, and we're going to have more ministry from the music of the Melody Airs in just a bit. Before we go back to Dr. James Dunn this evening, we have, we have several requests that have been called in tonight, and many folks, deservedly so, rightly so, legitimately so, are very, very concerned that we pray for our troops many that are even in route right now overseas uh, on the heels of this most recent crisis with a uh, world leader who has uh, been killed in, in a great military operation right now. And we need to pray for those in authority. And that, of course, includes our local law enforcement personnel that's frontline homeland security but we especially need to pray right now and uh, I want to ask you if you would Dr. James Dunn would you just pray you have a lot of family with military connection and you have a heart for them as many of our viewers do would you just pray briefly right now Keith my, my when I, I grew up uh, my first few years on the, uh, the Fort Riley Army Base in Kansas. My dad was in the Army. Yeah. And uh, my, my, my father-in-law was in the Army. My brother-in-law was Air Force uh, Navigator on, the, on a tanker. My, my brother-in-law served in Germany, so I'd be happy to, to pray. He'd be honored if you yeah. would, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we come to you right now 
we are lifting up our men and women uh, who serve. They serve some here in Spartanburg and Greenville area. They, some are serving around the world. They're serving local law enforcement uh, units. They're serving in the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, the Navy. There are men and women who've, who have already boarded airplanes uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. We saw them on TV. They're headed into harm's way. There are people who are serving right now in Iraq that are in harm's way. There are people serving uh, in Korea. They've been there for 50, uh, not one person, but uh, our unit for 50 years in Korea. Mm -hmm. There are folks, Lord, who are, who are standing uh, on the front of freedom. We pray that you would protect them. We pray that you would give comfort to the people who are back home, the, the husbands, the wives, the children who are holding the ropes back here uh, at home. They're worried about their daddy or their mommy. Give them comfort, Lord. Give, this, give our politicians, our diplomats, wisdom. Hmm. Good judgment as they seek out peaceful solutions for what's happening overseas. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And you rest assured that we will continue to pray for those friends and those families and those loved ones who are serving in the military for now many years. There's a segment in this program where we pray for those in the military and um, tragically, unfortunately, we have now been at war for so long that uh, there's a, a temptation unintentionally and there's a tendency sometimes uh, to, to not remember the way we should, but may we always remember. Remember this, our scripture for the evening is Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. No greater power, no greater political power, no greater financial power, no greater intellectual power in the world, any greater than the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And from what I've been able to hear you say this evening, Dr. James Dunn from Spartanburg, South Carolina, surgeon, that the gospel and its transformative power is not just a, a one and done experience, but it, it, it's the beginning of a lifelong journey in your own life. That's right. It is, it is a journey that you know, it, it's like uh, or similar to someone who wants to uh, become healthy. Mm -hmm. You just can't decide that you're going to become healthy and then exercise for a few weeks and then be healthy for the rest of your life. Right. You know, you've got to take on that exercise routine or that diet regimen, and it's got to continue lifelong if you're going to stay healthy. And you know, I, we, we can't make a decision to follow Christ in the fourth or fifth grade and think that that, that it just stops just like that. Yeah. We, we didn't stop our arithmetic in the fourth or fifth grade. We didn't stop learning how to read and write in the fourth or fifth grade. We, we went through secondary school or high school, and we grew built on what we learned in the fourth or fifth grade. We, we continue to grow spiritually through our high school days. If we are, happen to, be, go to go to school, second college, or if we start into a job, it's, we need to grow hmm. spiritually as we become a husband or a wife or as we become a parent. It's gonna, it, we've got to continue to grow because little eyes are going to be watching us. And um, we want, you know, you, uh, we can't pass on our spirituality to our children like we can money. You know, That's we, right. you know it, it, it's not inheritable. They have to make the decision on their own. And then they've got to pick up the mantle and grow. And then we want them to teach their children. We, we can teach our grandchildren, you know. Sure. Uh, but we, we can't pass it on. They, they, they're not going to be great Christians because I made a profession of faith at a young age. They, they, they've got to do it on their own. It's got to be personal it's to gotta them. It's got to be personal. It's got to be personal. You mentioned just a few minutes ago about uh, physical fitness and, and being healthy. If someone comes to you and uh, let's say maybe they, they are battling adult onset diabetes and, and there's high blood pressure problems and, and other things and, and these are things that have just come into being in their adult life that can be controlled by exercise and, and diet. Uh, how, how do you communicate to them uh, successfully and effectively what you just communicated to me 
about it being a lifelong experience, and, and how do they receive it? Well, as you can imagine, some don't receive it well, and some do receive some advice well. I, I, do, I do a lot of operations, and so I try to get people uh, in good shape before their surgery, so they can get through their surgery, and then, and then get them back onto the, to, uh, their exercise routine afterwards. And, and uh, I try to remind people that you know, they didn't get into this situation overnight. You know, someone, mm -hmm. doesn't, someone doesn't gain 100, 100 pounds overnight. And I try to remind them that you can't lose 100 pounds overnight either. It's gonna, it's gonna, you, it takes a while to gain 100 pounds. It takes a while to lose 100 pounds. But, but we want to keep our eye on what the goal is. Our, mm -hmm. our goal is we want to be healthy grandparents. We want, we want, we want to, I, I keep t reminding folks, I said, listen, you want to be around. I, I, I've got a friend of mine who's having some trouble right now, and I keep trying to remind him, listen, you want to be there when your daughter graduates. She goes, they, they go to Clemson, as a matter of fact. You want, yeah. to, you want to be at your, at your daughter's graduations at Clemson. You want to be there when they walk down the aisle. You want to walk them down the aisle. You want to be there when that grandbaby's born. Uh, you, those are, these are the landmarks that, that you want to see in your life. So I want to try to get you back healthy again. Let's get yeah. you back on, a, on an exercise program. Let's get you back on a healthy eating program. We may have to use your family practitioner to help get us some, some medications or some, some different regimens. But let's, let's try to get you looking forward to the, the goals you've got in the future. Because um, I can get out, out, of, out of whack if I, if, I, if, I, if I look too short. You know, I, there's some things I need to do. Uh, I've got a daughter 22, another one 25, another one 28. And so sometimes I've got some short-term goals. But really, I, I've got long-term goals. That I, that I want to be, I want to be there. For my, I don't have any grandchildren yet. Yeah. But I, I'm 59. I, I hope someday we will. But so I want to keep myself in good shape, so I'll be there for my for my daughters. You know, and and so I try to give them a look into the future. We can't accomplish this in a week, but we want to accomplish it by a year or two. We, we, we let's get you back healthy, and yeah, let's get you back after your operation. I don't want you lifting you know more than say a gallon of, of whole milk. It's, it's about 10 pounds. Yeah. But uh, to we get your get you all healed up, but then I want you to get back to doing everything you were doing, and and you walking out in the neighborhood, uh, going to the gym, uh, eating healthy, to try to to try to live a healthy lifestyle for the rest of your life. So that's why that's why I try to point people to. It it seems to me, and it sounds to me, as if there's there's even some parallels to being physically fit, physically healthy, and being spiritually healthy. Does that make any sense? Oh, absolutely. I think that it's, as, it's, as, it's, it's equally important to be active, whether, whether you are active in your neighborhood, walking around the block with your dog or your children or your wife, and then equally trying to do, do your daily, daily devotional, uh, growing with people, tr trying to be intentional about going to breakfast with a friend and talking about spiritual things, yeah. trying to grow spiritually. Uh, because we don't want to be stagnant either in our spiritual life or our physical life. And there's, there's got to be some accountability, doesn't there? There does. And, uh, in it, both. In both. Physically. It, it's important that we have someone who holds us account, accountable spiritually. It's, 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 easy, it's, 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 it's easy for Christians to say, well, this, is very, this is my personal yeah. spiritual life. Yeah. You know, it's between me and the Lord. Yeah. Well, it is between you and the Lord in a sense. But it's important that there's, for, say for us, for we men, sure. to, to have someone who can say, now, hey, James, now, have you been doing your, your, your devotional this week? Are you, have you been praying? Are you, are you, have you been the kind of husband you need to be? It's, it's good to have someone hold us accountable. Yeah. And then if you've got someone who, is a, um, who, who can hold you accountable with exercise, that's good, too. I, I, I did some running a few years ago, and I had uh, two guys. We, we would meet at, uh, we'd run around Millick in, in Spartanburg. If you come down 85 to 585, you get that beautiful Millican Research Facility. We, we would run there on Saturday mornings early. Well, it made it so much easier knowing that, that two guys were waiting on me to get there. There you, you know, go. And it held me accountable to get there. Because I could have easily punched the old snooze button and rolled back over. But when I knew that uh, my two friends were going to meet me, it, it held me accountable. And I've got folks to do that, hold me accountable spiritually. And, and, you, and you find that in being a part of a local church as well, don't you? Right. Rather than just well, I'm going to stay home and watch it online, whatever. But when you know that there's a Bible study class or a worship service or a prayer partner or ministry group or whatever that uh, is expecting you to be there. Well, 
I, I, I can sit out in the woods with my, my neighbor and, and he calls turkeys and I, I look and listen and so forth. I can really enjoy what God made there. I, I, I can really enjoy it, okay? But it's not a substitute for going to church on Sunday right. morning. You know, it's, it's not a substitute for sitting next to somebody who is trying to worship also. It's not a substitute for turning the pages in my Bible and looking for that, that scripture. I can worship. Yes, I can worship out there, but it's not a substitute for being in my local church and Amen. singing and, and listening to the pastor. Amen. Amen. I've said this time and time again over these many, many years. Uh, this ministry was founded and uh, grounded by a man, Dr. James Thompson, who believed fervently in the sanctity of a local church. In fact, he was a pastor and he had a pastor's heart. And uh, TV 16 was never intended to be a uh, competitor to the local church, but simply uh, a connector to the local church. And we encourage you, if you do not have a church home, if you do not have a church family, get involved somewhere where they're teaching and preaching the Word of God. I know you're in a teaching and preaching church. Good, healthy diet includes both. And I praise the Lord for the ministry of your church and every other church that is represented here tonight. We're going to come back in a moment and uh, we're going to find some time to talk more to Dr. James Dunn. What a privilege it is. But right now we're going to find some time to hear Melody Ayers sing a song entitled, Find Time. How about that? Find time. Take some time and listen to them. Turns dark way too soon Before you realize it's late afternoon And you haven't spent any time alone So you whisper a silent prayer Say tonight I'll meet you there in that private place Where we used to go Oh, he's heard these words before, still he chooses to wait once more, knowing from the start nothing will change. You have to find time for the Lord, you have to find time in his word, to ever find the peace you're searching for. To find time on your knees, you have to find time to receive a healing to your life. He will restore to ever find life's riches reward. You have to find time. find time in its word to ever find the peace we're searching for we have to find time on our knees we have to find time to receive 
What a, what a sweet, sweet message in that song, Find Time to uh, Hear from the Lord. And, th and that's what we do when we go to church. But I want to ask you this, James, my friend, my brother in Christ. What happens when we leave church? Do we A, take what we've heard and apply it and start walking it out or or should we just should we just put it in the bank should we just put it in the in in the in the cupboard put it in the pantry and just just let it build How, what's the what's the most spiritually healthy thing to do you know pastor we are not called to be secret agents mm. you know, we are supposed to be ambassadors for Christ yep and uh, we are supposed to take it with us uh, uh, but it's not comfortable for a lot of us, okay? Right. Uh, you know, you, you, you're a pastor, and so uh, some folks who are listening say, well, of course he's going to talk about Jesus everywhere he goes. He's a pastor, you know? But the truth of the matter is all of us have Christ living in our heart, who have Christ living in our heart are supposed to be out on, in the workplace sharing that. And I'll give you an example, which I was kind of nervous about this, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, my mother grew up in Louisiana, as did my, my father, and so that's how I got a tie with Louisiana. And so we still have our place in Louisiana. And so we, have, we needed some outdoor lighting uh, for, for behind the house. And so I went over to Gray Bar, which is a, an electrical supply house in Spartanburg. And so um, the gentleman who was sur taking, taking my serving me was asking what were they for and how, much, how many what do they call it, luminaires or whatever I needed, you know, to, how many lumens I needed, have electricity. So I was telling him where it was. He goes, oh, he says, he says, from Louisiana, he says, he says, I love Duck Dynasty. I said, really? I said, I said well, I like Duck Dynasty also. I said, you know, those guys really have a strong faith. And, and he, said, he says, I love Godwin. I love I loved to, to watch Godwin on TV. So I had gotten a devotional book by, by Duck Dynasty. So I just thought, you know, Lord, this is, this is an open door right here. I can either just buy my lights and leave here and not say a word about yeah. spiritual things, or I can walk this open door. So I, I went back out, uh, uh, I went back home that day, and I went and got that devotional book. And I went through there, and every page that Godwin had written on the devotional, I dog-eared that page, hmm. okay? And the next day I took it back, and I, and I went back to, to see this gentleman, and uh, I won't use his name. I'll protect his, for his sure. name. But I, I said, hey, you know, I had a great time talking to you yesterday about, God, about Godwin. And this is a devotional book from Dick Duck Dynasty. I'd like to give it to you as a gift from me. And I've, I've dog-eared everything that, that Godwin has said in there. And he was, he was appreciative of that, okay? But I didn't know if it meant anything to him or not. Yeah. Okay? So, but over the years, and, uh, as I've gone back in there, so we've had, developed a sweet relationship over time. And I did come to find out that he is a Christian. And... Uh, in fact, he called me not too long ago. He, he was going to make a, a decision with he and his wife about their spiritual life. And so he asked me what I pray for him. Hmm. And so, you know, I, I could have easily just been a secret agent. Yeah. Gone in and bought my lights and left and never said anything. But I just, even though I was nervous and scared, um, I, I'm not afraid, Keith, to do an operation on somebody and open up and fix what's broken. And, and sure. That doesn't scare me at all. Sure. Okay? I pray about it before I do that. I pray but for wisdom. Do but you, pray, do you pray with the patient? I do. I do pray with my, with my patients. But I'm, even though I'm not afraid to do, do that operation, I'm a lot more afraid to go and talk at 
the store or something like that about my spiritual life. Yeah. I, it's, just, it's not my comfort zone. But I just was, I just had to take the Lord's, be, be brave and say, Lord, Lord yeah. guide me here. So, yeah. so over time, I've developed that relationship with him. And so I've encouraged him and he's encouraged me. And I just try to, as I'm going about my business, if I can, if a patient says something or if, if uh, something comes up at a, at a store, a little, little uh, opening, I try to say something about the Lord in there. And I, I try to tell patients, this is how the Lord made us. This is how right. God made us. And so we're going we're gonna to do this and do that. I keep trying to bring the Lord into the conversation. It's easy. It's easier to not bring the Lord into the conversation. It's easy, much easier. Much, yeah. much easier. Just to, just to be the doctor, be the, the father, be the... Years ago, I, I taught my, my kids soccer. I mean, I was the coach. I wasn't good. But, uh, you know, it's, it's easier just to, to not bring the Lord up. But we're not called to be secret agents. We're called to be ambassadors. And so I think it's important... Whether we are the person at the grocery store who's checking somebody out to say, "Have a blessed day." Yeah. All right. You know, if you're if they're if you're if you're working at Lowe's and you're helping somebody load two by fours, that you you know, be a Christian in that environment. Whatever your, the Lord has called your task to be, that you try to be the Christian in that environment. Because sometimes we are the best Jesus people are going to see. People, a lot of people are not going to come to my church to meet Jesus. True. They're going to meet somebody maybe from my church or another one of my sister churches in the in the workplace and then that that we've got to be an attractive aroma to to bring them to the lord they 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 need to smell sweetness in our personhood to be attracted to the lord and we can't go around being sour and there's i've got a picture in my in my office in each of the exam rooms it's a picture of jesus laughing he's got his head cocked back he's just laughing his mouth is open he's, he's looking up he's just laughing I think that Jesus must have been one of the most fun and funny people to be around. Huh. Um, I think he must have had a great sense of humor. Now, I'm, I'm not Jewish, and I, I heard a pastor one time say, he says, he says, you know, those of us who grew up uh, speaking English as our primary language and who don't know, no, no, don't know Aramaic, we don't know Hebrew, he says, he says, we miss out a lot of the, of the words that Jesus probably used for, that, was, that, was, that was funny. But one thing that I know that, you know, you know children aren't going to go around a sourpuss. They're not, going to go, they're not going to go around a sourpuss. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about Jesus being Santa Claus and versus the Grinch, but just let's use that as an example. We just finished sure. the Christmas season. Sure. If you put the Grinch in one chair and Santa Claus over here, the children are going to come in and they're going to go over here to Santa Claus. They're not going to go to the Grinch. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, when Jesus said, hey, disciples, let the children come to me. I mean, they, they were trying to keep the kids away. He was like a magnet for the kids because his personhood was so sweet, uh, and the children wanted to come around him. I, I think I, I picture Jesus in my mind as being funny and fun. Um, when he told the disciples, hey, you guys are on the wrong side of the boat, to the, to the, to the professional fishermen, these guys had grown up fishing. Yeah. And Jesus says, hey, you know, you know you guys are on the wrong side of the boat now. And, and uh, you know, those boats on the Sea of Galilee couldn't be but about 12 or 14 feet wide. Now, I'm not really a fisherman. My mother's a fisher, fishwoman, but I'm not a fisherman. But you, I can't really see how you could catch fish over here, but not 14 feet away. Mm -hmm. you know, so when, 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 the, when the disciples are trying to have been fishing all night long, they've got nothing, and Jesus comes and says, Hey, guys, you're all on the wrong side of the boat. I imagine Peter was like, Are you kidding me? You're, really? You're, 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 really? really? Carpenter? You're yeah. a carpenter. Yeah. You know, if you're from Nazareth, you're a carpenter. We are the fishermen. And he says, I just tell you, if you just fish 14 feet away over on that side of the boat, you can't pull it in. It'd be too much for you. I think he must have, when they started pulling those fish in and started counting them, and I don't know why they counted out 153 or 156. How many people yeah. that, that's how yeah. many languages there were in the world. I don't really know why, but to me, I think Jesus was just laughing. He says, count them out, boys. When they got to the line, 154, 155. I think Jesus was just laughing. He says, guys, oh, yeah. I love you. He says, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I, I, think, I think he was so fun to be around. I mean, he, he drew huge crowds. He drew huge crowds. And, well, we, we know he was passionate. He, he would also weep with people. Jesus wept. When you are, are doing medicine and you're doing ministry as, as a way of life, uh, periodically, from time to time, uh, you, have to, you have to give some bad news. How do you do that? You know, it... it Depending whether they're a Christian or they're not, I have a little bit of a different different technique. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but the main thing is just trying to be there with them, be there right. in the moment. And sometimes, sometimes you just have to take, just hold their hand and just and not say anything. Just sometimes you just sit there, 
and let them process something, some bad news, and just hold their hand. And, you, and I say, listen, I want you to get, get a notebook. I want you to write some questions down. And we're going to talk, we're going to talk again because I've, I've given you some really bad news today. Right. Um, we're, we're going to have to talk again. Sometimes we pray together. Sometimes, sometimes we just pray that, the, that, that we'll have wisdom for, for, for me and wisdom for my, my, the team that I work with. Sometimes it's chemotherapy doctors or medical oncologists. Sometimes it's radiation doctors. That's, we're going to work together to try to get past this. Or sometimes, sometimes when people are, are at, the end of, at the end of their earthly life, we just pray together. We um, just hold their hand. And we, just, we hug them and just let them administer just by touch. Sometimes just by being. My dad is a, a doctor. He's, he's, re, he's retired officially now. He still goes every day to the hospital and ministers. He calls it the ministry of presence. He says, just go be with them. He says, just hold their hand. Maybe rub their shoulder, yeah, you know, and to just be with them. And if it's if it's a, if it's uh, if they're a Christian and they uh, and they know the Lord our personal Savior, then sometimes we will share together in a different way and pray together. If they if they're lost, if they don't know the Lord, then we try to give them hope uh, for a cure, for a physical cure, and then we try to kind of move them in the direction that they may want to seek out mm. some spiritual uh, help, either from from me praying with them or from from a pastor. Or I've got I've got a Bunch of folks in my in my phone that I'll that I'll call up and say, can I, can I send somebody to see you? So sometimes I'll I'll do that. I'll use a bunch of resources to try to get yeah. them past that's bad powerful. news. The the ministry of presence, and and that's what Jesus here again. Jesus, that's what he practiced as the good shepherd. Yeah. You know, we're, we're we're all funny about about time. Um, <clears throat> we want the person that we're with to spend all the time that we need with them. Okay. Yeah. But we don't want to wait for it. For instance, like you know, if if we're the per, the patient in the doctor's office, or we're the person in the pastor's study, we want that time as precious. We want it to go on as long as we can. Okay. But we're out in the waiting room waiting for our turn. We're like, what is taking them so long in there? What is? Yeah. What's he doing in there? You know, and what the next person may be waiting for you to, to talk to you. The next next young couple that wants to get married that you may be giving counseling. They're like, what is taking Pastor Keith so long? But when we're in that time. We want to make it then the most important person that we can, and it's it's it's, it's a you know it's it's a a way uh, we got to weigh the, the that's, I'm, not, I'm not using the right word Keith but you know we've got to try to minister to give them all of us when, when they're there in front of us. You're right. And then hurry to the next patient or hurry to the next to the next couple that needs needs it, counseling. It's like we're juggling yeah, juggling plates, yeah. balance yeah. and act. It, yeah. it really really and truly is. Yeah. Well, I have I have thoroughly thoroughly and sincerely enjoyed our hour together and uh, we have we have been here together for an hour been a very quick hour and we've had the melody airs they've been fantastic by the way I they mean, really were, enjoyed you all they you were, all have a talent that I know that I don't have I don't I don't know if Keith can sing but you've got a talent that's remarkable I, I, I really admire your talent well let me go ahead and, and settle that Keith can't sing <laughs> Keith can't sing if Keith uh, needs to clean clean out the building, just let him start <laughs> singing. But uh, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. You've already prayed for our military tonight, but uh, we have a, had a lot of requests that have been called in. And uh, I want to just encourage you, as the Spirit of God brings these folks to your mind, would you just pray for them on your way home tonight yes. and even this coming week? And we are certainly going to be remembering you in prayer as well. And we have some more requests that she has just laid down for us on the desk here. A lot of things going on in the world. And just let me encourage you, if you're watching tonight, you may, you may feel like you're in the waiting room. And uh, you're waiting on God to do something. And you wish that He would just hurry up. Listen, the great physician has not forgotten you. He has not forgotten you. And He's not going to leave you. And He's not going to forsake you. He uh, is going to do what's best. In the last minute or two of the program tonight, Dr. Dunn, I heard one of uh, Tony Evans' children uh, just a few days ago say in light of their mother's passing that when their mother, uh, Dr. Lois Evans, was passing away, that at first he wondered, why didn't God heal her? Why didn't God heal her? Here's this world-known 
uh, minister's wife, why didn't God heal her? And he said it was as if he heard the still small voice of God say immediately when she got sick, you should have known I was either going to heal her or I was going to heal her. And that really spoke to my heart. So I appreciate the fact that God has put you in a healing ministry, whether people are being healed or they're going to be healed. He's using you in a great way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. And Thank I you. appreciate you so much. And I appreciate you being with us on this first hour of Nightline. We're going to take a short break in just a moment, and then we're going to come back for the last half of Nightline. We're going to hear and have the Melody Airs back for more music. God bless you, and I'll see you on the other side of this break.